everyone. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, I'm going to just adjust the camera because I think you should be able to see everything, but let me know if I need to adjust anything, but it's a little bit crooked, so I'm just going to do that. And I got to tell you how insane I was earlier. <laughs> it took me way longer than I thought to get set up for this morning. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's already a fair number of you. So I wanted to just... I think I might be a crazy person because this morning I decided I should probably um, learn how to spin <laughs> this flax, especially with the die staff, because setting it up, sorry, diff staff, I don't know why I've always called it a die staff, but you know, that's a different discussion topic. But um, I don't have a really convenient way of like setting that up, so I just went ahead and did that. So I got a sample going. But then just before the stream, I was thinking, hmm, you know, I have this leftover tiny bit of fleece that I want to wash so that it's ready to card um, in a couple of days because I have to spin up a sample for somebody. And I did that right before the stream. <laughs> so of course I had to go deal with that before I could finish setting up. So <laughs> Made it just in time. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, uh, there's lots of you already in the stream, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get started, but a couple of quick updates. So for those of you who have um, been interested uh, in my sweater, this is all hand spun, and so I've got one sleeve done, and another one that is probably at around the halfway mark now. So I'm really looking forward to finishing this. The last little bit I'm going to do is I'll probably do a collar on it, but I've done a couple of fittings and it's, it's really, really good. It fits me the way that it should. I'm actually wearing, this is a cardigan I've knitted a couple of times and I love it. Um, I don't know if I've actually ever shown it off. But it has, um, it's mostly merino, just like this, this white part of the sweater. Um, but I've knitted this a couple of times just because I'm scared to make a sweater. Things that have to join in the front, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but when I'm done with this, I'm going to do like a recipe knit. So that will be, um, available pretty much as soon as I get done. There's no need to test knit it because it's just based on whatever yarn you have and whatever gauge, um, you're going to knit with. So for me, I decided to have a, um, I wanted a looser, more drapey fabric. So I used slightly larger needles than I think I would have. So, um, yeah, hopefully I'll be able to get back to putting out patterns somewhat re uh, frequently. So, um, yeah, Car <laughs> yeah, um, I'm actually terrified about steaking. Um, a lot of people do it for, um, like, pattern it, so like fair isle or color work. Just the thought of cutting my knitting terrifies me. <laughs> so, hello everyone. So, um, just to name a few people who are already in the chat, we've got Sonia, Crystal, um, Jennifer, um, not me, Jennifer. <laughs> Another one, it's a very popular name. We've got Chris, and Evie from Jillian Eve. Um, we have Maureen. Um, Cheryl. Let's see who else is, who has said hi. <laughs> I think that's everyone who said hi so far. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to sort of talk very briefly about is, um, as many of you know, I, have uh, 
not just spinning fibers in my shop, I've got yarn. And so I've been experimenting with the idea of hand dyeing um, mill spun yarns from heritage breeds. So I was talking with the, the mill and they sent a bunch of samples. So I've got a bunch of these to look at. I'm gonna bring this camera a little closer. Let's get more intimate. <laughs> As we talk about wool. Okay. So first of all, um, these were all just kind of like random things that they had extra. So um, it was quite a generous sample. But for those of you who have followed my um, Fiber Talk series over the years, one of the things that you develop as a spinner is the ability to um, recognize fibers by the way that they feel, the way that they look. Um, sometimes even by the way that they smell, depends, um, but really cool. Um, these two samples are both Ryland, and when I was talking to the, the mill, he said, yeah, they're probably Ryland. This one, uh, that's sort of like a really nice uh, soft brown, this is Manx. This one is Suffolk. This one is uh, Jacob. And these are Shetland. And even though these might have come from um, sheep that were crossed with something else. So like I have a Shetland that was crossed with Blue Face Lester, so it's kind of a really shiny Shetland. Um, by doing breed studies, um, and really evaluating the characteristics of your wool, um, you can actually take no name, no identifier yarns like this and get a pretty approximate um, breed origin from just that. So um, yeah, I was sort of expecting there to be some indicators of what was what, but um, yeah, I think it was just sort of like how mills will produce ends. So I think they were just like chucked into a container <laughs> to be used for random other things. So um, they were sent as samples to kind of show me as a dyer um, what the mill could spin for um, their customers. So yeah, I mean, you can get Jacob yarn, but I don't know how often you find it. Um, and Jacob is a really lovely workhorse um, wool. So yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited to um, uh, experiment with designing my own yarns and then have a mill spin it for me. So. Uh, Maureen says, Ah, yes, mill ends um, are really great for various projects. Um, I think that if you wanted to make really inexpensive blankets, you know, you could probably get a real discount on just whatever they, they have available, and they would be so warm and soft and comfy. So this, this particular mill is a little bit unusual because they produce woolen spun yarns rather than worsted spun yarns. So um, if you're new to spinning, um, those are basically uh, used for, they're different spinning methods and preparation methods and they're used for different applications. So there are some um, few companies that do uh, woolen style yarns and this particular mill is one of them. So I'm really excited to get the chance to actually um, work with, with them um, in the near future. So fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, so today we are going to be working with flax. So I've got my flax here that came from wildfibers.co.uk. Um, this is from, um, well it says Dutch flax, so I don't know exactly where it was processed. I imagine it was all done in the same location. Um, 
so probably imported from Belgium. And then I split it into basically a third, and then I've attached it to my distaff. <laughs> now, um, huge, huge disclaimer to begin. This is not a tutorial. <laughs> I am very much a beginner at all of this, including how do you actually put it on this dang thing. So I bought this, um, it's a medieval style distaff, and there's a join somewhere around, actually I think it's about here, where the top comes off and you can use it as a handheld version, or this one where you can actually kind of hook it down into um, a belt for longer fibers like flax. Uh, I haven't used it to spin wool yet mainly because um, I've been doing lots of other projects that I wouldn't need it for, so I will make time to actually do that. So yeah, um, I've watched a few tutorials over the years, um, so I'll see if I get the name right. Josephine uh, Warf Wafen, I think? Josephine? No, that's not the right. Um, maybe if Evie uh, has a second. I don't know if she said she was here and um, busy doing other things, but um, it's, oh, Josephine Watlin. Watlin, maybe? Um, I watched her video on how to um, dress a distaff, and then I watched um, Evie uh, do her distaff day, um, I think it's January 8th every year, or thereabouts. So I understand in principle how this is supposed to work and the point of this ribbon, which is actually just some bulky spun merino yarn that I had laying around. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so if you want to learn with a beginner, which is totally what I am, then great. Um, Hopefully, if there are any really complicated questions, um, I can uh, see if there's anybody else out there who uh, would be able to answer them, but I might not be able to answer them during the stream. So I am spinning this dry because I saw Evie do it and it seemed to be perfect. Um, she said, and maybe she'll clarify, when she's done spinning and she skeined it up, she boils it. I don't know if I'm going to leave this as a single or if I'm going to ply it. I imagine I'm going to ply it. I'm gonna set up my foot on the wheel. Okay. Yeah, so um, I am going to spin it dry. I might use a little, <laughs> just to get um, this adhered to uh, what I've just spun. And I'm probably gonna be holding this all wrong, so don't take this as the way to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, um, how are we doing? Can you actually see this? Can I, should, I, should I lower the camera a little bit? Just, just let me know um, about that. And I also can't help myself. I must be a glutton for punishment because I'm totally spinning this super duper fine. Which is a, a huge challenge because if you don't grab enough fibers, it just, it'll break, basically. And I've got a big bunch of fibers that just won't draft. It's just making a big knot at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Ugh. Look at that. It's just, ugh. Okay. Fix that in a second. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so it's Joseph and Watlin. Okay. Boiling with washing soda. I don't think I have any washing soda. So is that good? Bring you maybe a little closer. Lower that just a bit. Yeah, so I do have here on... Um, 
the Kromsky wheel, uh, Kromsky minstrel wheel, this comes off and you can put a distaff here. I could see if um, it's the same size uh, topper that would actually fit on here, so maybe. Um, but yeah, this, this wheel is designed to have um, that attachment. It's part of the reason why I decided on this one, because there's a lot of versatility. There's the double treadle, the um, scotch tension. It's got a really small uh, footprint. So um, when I lived in Korea, I needed something that was going to be um, compact. And um, I wanted something that had a lot of versatility so that I could just do some upgrades in the future. Okay, back to um, failing miserably. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I'm kind of spinning this a bit uh, like I did my silk hankies video. So if you remember um, when I was spinning yarn, uh, the silk hankies rather, um, I was doing an overhand draft like this because it felt uh, much more comfortable. My, la my wheel is really loud today, so apologies if um, my camera is picking up a lot of the noise from it. But as Evie has said, uh, some wheels just have a lot of chatter. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, um, I'm probably spinning what would be the equivalent of a cobweb yarn, and, oh dear, I keep grabbing a bit too much every so often and then it just oh goodness produces a big lump <laughs> it's it's fine because it doesn't have to be beautiful <laughs> yeah okay um Uh, I do have baking soda, although it's called sodium bicarbonate here, just because Britain has to be different. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm realizing that my uh, yarn is too thin for the camera to really pick it up, but you can kind of see what my hands are doing. So this hand is drafting overhand, pulling away. So yeah, it's pulling away, and this hand is desperately trying to um, keep the fibers sort of like fanned out a bit, like that. And I'm using an S twist uh, for the yarn because flax has a natural proclivity to twist that way. Um, yeah. You can, you can sort of see the, the trouble that I'm having with this drafting. And I know that whenever you first start doing something, you, you know, you're going to have a lot of beginner growing pains. I feel like I'm much more <laughs> stressed out and hyper aware of what I'm doing than I was last week when I was spinning uh, the pure bamboo over the fold. So, um, some spinning principles are probably more transferable uh, between different types of fibers than others, and obviously it's going to uh, depend on the type of fiber you're working with, so I feel like if you were to put wool into my hands, I would have 
almost no problem spinning it, no matter which wool you gave me. But obviously, flax is a very different fiber than cotton. <laughs> so there would be uh, major differences between them. Still, you would have a lot of transferable skills between both spinning fibers, but I think the beginner stage, the learning curve, would be much more um, accentuated in that case than it would be if you were just spinning, um, say, a uh, Jacob wool versus cashmere. Hopefully that makes sense. And I'm trying not to fatigue my hand too much by um, holding the, the distaff like this, but I don't really know how else to hold it so that um, I can access the wool, because you, or wool, I just call it wool. Um, but you can see just like how, how much uh, this length is being taken up here. It's probably a good two and a half feet long, which means the only place for me to really grip this is at the bottom. So, um, I don't want my hand to get really tired or cramped, so I'm just trying to hold my arm at a comfortable level and do the spinning, but occasionally the top wants to kind of tilt back like that, and it's, you know, obviously if I do this for a really long time, that's going to be extremely fatiguing. So, um, yeah, just trying to <laughs> manage everything. <laughs> um, doing this as a beginner uh, live is probably presenting an extra challenge too. Although I had this problem when I was spinning it earlier this morning as well. Um, let's see here. No success without failure. That is so. That is so true, Crystal. I can't tell me how many times I failed when I first started spinning wool. Oh dear. Um, so my very first experience with hand carding, I had to learn how to spin, and um, it was for my master's, my first master's dissertation. So I basically hired a local lady who taught me how to spin and then she said okay the other thing you need to learn how to do is process wool and then spin it because that's the best way to learn how to do that part right if you always get it processed from somebody else and then you have to do it yourself it's it's much more revealing in, in the uh, process because you have a better understanding of the way that it's prepared because you've done it um, in that experience, I was spinning Cotswold, and um, I had literally one weekend to learn how to do all this. So I carded wool to the point where all of my shoulder muscles were aching and sore, and I couldn't get out of bed one day. I just had to lay on um, a heating pad. <laughs> that was a, a not-so-fun day. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, failures during that process, so I learned very quickly which rollouts would spin well and which ones wouldn't. So um, Maureen has asked, would you say that flax requires more twists to stay together than wool? Now, theoretically, no, because the longer staple of flax means you need fewer twists per inch because the overlap of the fiber doesn't... Um, so this is draft spinning flax. And so because you're talking about a staple length that's probably around two feet, uh, 24 inches or, though, or thereabouts, you don't need to have as many twists uh, per inch because there's um, a much longer staple length. And so you could probably get away with spinning it very low twist. I'm spinning it very high twist because I don't know what I'm doing and I don't want to be frustrated with it breaking or drafting apart a bunch. So 
I couldn't tell you exactly how many twists I have right now, but it's probably about four twists per inch just by eyeballing it. That's fairly low in terms of um, twist angle. Let's see here. The twist angle would probably be something like 10 to 15 degrees of twist. Hopefully that, that makes sense. So you don't need a lot of twist in order to hold the flex together. Um, you also don't necessarily have to spin it as spun if you don't want to. So tradition and proclivities have sort of made it seem like it always has to be done one way or the other, but in the archaeological record, for example, wool was spun in S and Z directions. So um, if you spin your wool one way and someone spins it a different way, it doesn't really matter. If you're trying to be accurate for some time period, then yeah, it matters, but generally it's going to be dictated by personal preference and if you're if you're making a specific project where one spin direction might be better for the project uh, than another. So when I've spun hemp, I have opted to spin um, in the, uh, let's see here, Z direction for the singles because it doesn't really matter. Um, you could equally spin it in the S direction and that would be uh, fine as well. If anyone uh, needs help with what uh, I'm talking about in terms of Z and S directions, let me know. Can you actually see the yarn that I'm spinning? I've got a tiny screen right here, so I can't really see. I might be able to move the camera closer to me, but I don't know if it's going to be as uh, good close up as my other camera that I normally use for videos. Okay, so Sonia has also chosen this uh, Kromsky Minstrel for its versatility. <laughs> I mean, I bought this wheel with my first uh, major paycheck when I was living in Korea. So uh, I needed it to be able to do lots of different things. I didn't think I'd be able to justify purchasing another wheel so um, I wanted to get the one that I could upgrade the easiest. <laughs> yeah, my furry kids are upstairs. So it's been really, really cold and rainy in Leicester today. So I had to actually turn on the heat this morning because it was only about nine degrees outside, which means that was pretty probably about 50 degrees and because our house doesn't have double glazed windows all the heat that's in the house just gets sucked out so it was important to turn the heat on partially so I didn't freeze to death because for whatever reason I just always am cold except for when I'm exercising and then I'm like instantly sweating <laughs> it's really annoying <laughs> Um, yeah, so they are all crammed up under the radiators on blankets. <laughs> the poor dears. <laughs> yeah, there's so many ways to do things. So, you know, if, if this video is at all helping you, um, overcome hurdles to just sit down and do what I'm doing, great. <laughs> Maybe, um, I mean, for me, it was 
was actually watching Evie spin flax dry and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that because I don't want my um, bobbins to get warped at all. So I was really, really hesitant to spin it wet, but she didn't really have any problems with it and it looked pretty effortless. So I thought, hey, I'll do that too. <laughs> Yeah, it is, it is, I mean, at the end of the day, even my beginner yarn was really easy to work with. So I can't remember everything that I made, but uh, I made a couple of totes and um, mittens and uh, scarves with all my hand spun. It was an atrocious ga gauge quite variable but it was fine it was charming <laughs> and I I mean I feel like I do have some mastery over what I'm doing but there's still a lot to learn so you know I call myself a beginner at spinning flax because I feel like I am but because I've done so many years of spinning itself it just it's a lot easier and so yeah I am not using any water for this so one of the things that I'm doing is when I'm drafting out from the the base here I am kind of holding the yarn that's being spun sort of in the crevices of my fingers so let's see if I if I Pull out a little bit so you can see how I've kind of got it curled like that. So there's probably some skin oils. Maybe a little sweat, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds gross when you when you explain it. But there could be I mean I washed my hands before I sat down to spin just now. So it could just be um, my imagination but there could be some spinning or some hand oils and or sweat from this process that's helping to keep the fibers smoothed but no I'm not using any water at this stage because I don't want to damage my wheel or my bobbins because I only have five of them and if they start to get warped I'm afraid um, how that's going to affect my spinning and I'm not really in a position right now to get a bunch of replacement bobbins so I'm just trying to experiment and see if this is a viable way to spin and so far it does seem to be quite nice yeah so let me pull out a sample here If the camera will stop focusing on my face, I'll show you <laughs> how the yarn looks. <laughs> so hopefully you can kind of see that. I can't tell if it's focused. If it's if it's focused, let me know. Okay. Okay, so I guess yeah, you can see it. <laughs> um like I said, I feel like I'm just being really silly with the diameter I'm spinning it at. But I'm also trying to um be economical. I only have a hundred grams and I have no idea how much um, yarn I'll get with a hundred grams and I am interested in plying this. So I don't I don't think you could really over twist flax. That's actually a really good question because I was thinking um, rather than Apply it in the opposite direction. I was thinking about applying the, the two singles in the same direction in which I spun them 
because flax doesn't behave in quite the same way that wool does where it can get really hard and rope-like if you over if you over spin it um so if anyone has any experience plying linen let me know if that's a horrible idea or not okay so um crystals asked if there is more spit in the wet spin of flax than there is water could you clarify what you mean um by the by the comment are you are you asking if um you choose to spit spin versus wet spin and the total moisture content because yeah if that's the case then i would expect a spit spun flax yarn to overall be drier than if you just use water if that's what you mean let me know <laughs> Um, yeah, looks like a couple of you had the same question. Part of my issue is I've read some specialist reports about flax spreading in, um, sort of like the late 1870s where a lot of research was starting to become focused on the industrialization of flax production and how the wastewater was uh, affecting the local ecosystem because you're basically rotting the fiber in order to get this um, nice product which looking at the color it's a very dull kind of ashen blonde so that tells me that this was probably picked after it went to seed. Um, normally, a golden color is produced from flax that's been picked before it's seeded. Um, but knowing all of the processes that go into producing flax in this form, I don't want to ingest a bunch of bacteria that might not be good <laughs> i know people have done this in the past and some people argue that it's um, natural dyeing because it's natural and organic and it uses stuff from the local environment it's not actually bad but it absolutely can be so um you know i'm trying to use my a good sense at the same time <laughs> so yeah I'm sure there's loads of people out there who do a uh, spit spawn flax I just don't know enough about the risks of doing that to actually commit myself to doing it uh, on a regular basis so if you have a long history of spinning spat <laughs> spinning flax with spit <laughs> um, and you've got some relevant information please feel free to put that in the comments section because I would be interested to hear more it could just be that I have an overabundance of caution and that's why I don't want to uh, use spit in this case but if you recall back when I posted a um, community, community question, I think it was episode two, I addressed this whole issue of spinning flax and using flax dry versus wet. And it was a study that it was a, it was a material study done in 2017 where um, the researchers involved, I don't know why isn't it, oh there, it wasn't, 
being taken up. Why is it still not being taken up? I don't know. They showed through this study that under dry conditions, flax is very sturdy, but under wet conditions, it is not, <laughs> like at all. Which kind of led me to ask, why is there so much um, sort of colloquial, oh goodness, why is there so much um, colloquial information out there on spinning flax wet if spinning it wet means that it's a little bit, well, a lot um, weaker, you know what I mean? So if it's, if it's weaker, then why would you want to spin it wet versus dry? And then when it comes to weaving, since I know some weavers who work with um, linen, why they weave wet. So I got a few interesting answers. Um, I forget what they all were. I think it was Crowing Hen who I think I've mentioned in last week's uh, live stream. So um, she's worked a lot with linen. Oh dear, what am I doing here? Yeah, um, what was I saying? <laughs> oh, uh, on, on the community questions, um, video where I talk about spinning flax wet or dry, if you want to see what she said specifically about that, um, head over there because she's um, even got a book out on spinning linen, or spinning flax into linen, um, so I would consider her a greater authority on the modern idea of spinning and weaving flax wet or dry than I am. So, yeah. Um, I, I, I would check that out uh, if, you're, if you're curious. I don't really have an answer to it. Um, I'm just kind of going with what I've seen others do and experimenting <laughs> at this stage. <laughs> oh, goodness. Things got a little bit hairy, so to speak, with with the distaff. So I'm just getting these few fibers wrangled so that I can continue doing what I was doing. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, spit is super easy. It's right there, always. And because saliva contains enzymes, it will uh, start to break down um, other chemicals. So basically what you're activating with your spit on um, linen is the pectin. That's sort of the glue that's in um, vast fibers like this. Oh, Sonia just said that too. <laughs> yes. So it could just be um, the digestion, or digestion, the digestive enzymes in spit uh, were better for spinning flax than water, and so that might be part of the reason why it was more often adopted as a method, as well as being super convenient in terms of its location, and pretty much always access your spit. <laughs> oh 
Okay, thanks Jennifer for joining us. Um, obviously the, the VOD will be there for whenever you get back. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to eat anything <laughs> that might be unsavory. <laughs> It's the same thing when you're working with wool, uh, raw wool, you don't want to ingest it. So I don't mind if the cats roll around in the wool while it's dirty because I know that they're cats and they have uh, guts that generally will take care of some of the weird stuff that they might end up eating uh, in the wild. And obviously, if they're eating birds, which, um, you know, <laughs> they're prone to do <laughs> when they're outside, they're probably going to eat things that um, their bodies are well adjusted to dealing with. I just don't know if my body is going to be well adjusted to ingesting unsavory things from this flax. So I'll just avoid it until someone says, nah, it's totally fine. Yeah, that's true. If I'm, if I grow up uh, s spitting on my flax, then I've probably developed enough gut bacteria to deal with it. Sure, it's definitely true. So, Crystal, was it Crystal? Who said? Fiber's gone wild. Um, oh, it was someone who, Sonia asked, oh, Sonia said that it looks like, um, sewing thread. Uh, let me go grab a book real quick. I'll show you my very first um, experience with spinning flax. I think I did this with a spindle and I was just doing a sample trying to get a sense of what I was in for. <laughs> so this is a book that I made and some failed gouache paintings because I actually don't really like working with gouache. I found. So I repurposed this and I put all of my mead recipes in here. So this is all just like sketchbook paper, but the binding on it is linen thread. So I spun up probably about 10 or 15 yards and then I uh, used it to create the Coptic binding on this little book. I was kind of obsessed with book binding. <laughs> I think I was trying to find every excuse not to work on my PhD <laughs> at this point. So yeah, <laughs> I didn't have any linen thread and I was not gonna buy any because I'm really impatient and if it's something that I'm doing for the first time I'll try the the cheapest and or free method first before I actually commit to it. So I just went ahead and spun a little bit of flax and plied it and then I used um, I have a piece of beeswax that I use for the drive bands on my wheels so there's a little bit more grip to them and it also means that they don't abrade like at all and so I use that uh, for making this little it was supposed to be a sketchbook and it went through various iterations and now it holds all of my mead recipes <laughs> I have to update it this this needs to be uh, written in there but Back to spinning. So, is there anyone else um, 
in the chat who's spun flax wants to weigh in on anything that I've said that might be right or wrong. Have I inspired you to uh, do some flax spinning? <laughs> yeah, so way, way back, probably in... I want to say 2012, I wanted to start producing uh, journals with felted book covers and I wanted to um, use little bits of random off bits of wool with um, cotton and uh, wood pulp to create paper for these journals and it was a really lovely idea and then I decided to move to Korea instead and doing all the stuff there was a lot more difficult but the idea persists. Uh, I've come back to the idea again quite recently in part because I've got some wool that just you know how sometimes you get wool and you think, oh, I'm going to use it for this, and then you decide, no, I don't want to use it for that, I want to use it for something else, but I don't know what. I've kind of done that with some of this merino that I, I bought from um, a UK source. I don't really like it. Um, it's not fun to spin, and so I don't, I'm not as interested in producing bats for spinning with it, I thought, oh, well, what if I make pre-felt? And then I thought, ooh, what if I just make journals? <laughs> I pretend like I have a lot of time, but I don't. <laughs> so I keep revisiting this idea, and every time I sit down to do some work, I realize that I actually don't have time to do a lot of this stuff, so... It's an idea that's sitting there, and if I actually do start producing my own journals, um, maybe I'll, I'll take a, uh, a small hit in the organic, you know, created from scratch idea and just use pre-made paper, um, but otherwise use uh, wool for the... Um, the cover and then flax to stitch everything all together. I can spin flax. That would be, that'd be kind of cool. One day. I need a personal assistant. <laughs> Ooh, so I, I, um, I've occasionally watched some of the crafty things that Nerdforge does. I've got a lot of um, different crafting videos on my YouTube to watch list and she's done a lot of handmade books and she's got like the whole book point like the the kind of gear that you would use to make books by hand back in the early days of books in the mid in the medieval period I covet one so much, and uh, Sonia has just said that one of her mystery novels that she likes to read is, um, a, the main character is a bookbinder. <laughs> yeah, so I've spun some flax, um, so that recent post that I put on Instagram, uh, when I sort of, um, got everyone to guess what it was the next video was about. A lot of you guessed flax, but it was actually hemp. That was hemp in the photo. So there will be some upcoming videos on hemp. So if you, um, if you're interested in working with plant fibers that are long like this, but maybe, um, you want to work with something that's a little cheaper, 
hemp tends to be cheaper than flax, then maybe that video will be for you. Um, there will be a couple, so if the one that comes out isn't of interest, then there will be another one that comes out afterwards. I've been busy trying to come up with uh, a system of producing videos where I can kind of do a week of filming and then I can just edit when I have time. Now that I'm using DaVinci Resolve, it's so much faster for me to make videos that look good. Um, before, it would take me ages to make a halfway decent video. And so if I'm going to be busy with, you know, trying to get expertly dyed, making the kinds of content and products I want on a regular basis, I kind of have to um, move on to software that allows me to um, streamline the process of editing. So there will be some useful tutorials coming out, not dress spinning flex. That will be a while. <laughs> There are lots of other people who have done that, so if you're desperate to learn right away, I completely understand. Um, Evie's got some, like I said at the beginning, Joseph and Watlin. Um, I don't actually remember the name of her channel offhand, but she's got some. So head over there, see, see those tutorials. Um, Yeah, creating, <laughs> creating paper is not that easy. I've watched plenty of tutorial videos. I've seen people do it in person. I've done it before. I think, I think I was first introduced to the concept when I was a kid. I think we did something at a, an open air museum where you, you had these little um, jam jars that you put toilet paper in and you could put in um, like bits of flowers and you would shake it up and then you put it through a sieve and it would make this I think it was called a deckle box anyway that, that was like my earliest obsession with making paper <laughs> I made a lot of toilet paper paper <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's really difficult to make, and one of my friends asked me if I could just make a handmade watercolor paper, and I'm like, uh, my guess is no, because watercolor paper is extremely specific in how you make it, and it has to be sized so that you can um, move paint around and uh, scrub paint out if you need to. You also need something that's really sturdy so that you don't cause the paper to pill. So making quality paper is not, not as easy as you would think. Oh no, the kitty's awake. <laughs> Nerdforge, yeah, it's dangerous. Do you have any idea how many dioramas I want to make now? Do you have a pen I can use to... Um... Oh, I don't know where it is. I've uh, rearranged everything in the workroom, okay. so I, I couldn't tell you. It might be in one of those craft containers. Let's leave her alone. Yeah. Goodbye, Nana. <laughs> I'm. I am so impressed with how, like, the number of crafts she knows how to do and has all of the tech for. So she's done these, um, she did this one video where she made cosplay armor out of leather. She, I think she did another one out of foam. She's made books, she's made dioramas, she's, she's done art of various sorts. Um, she's done a lot of resin paints. It's crazy. Just in awe. <laughs> <laughs> so.
So if you want to learn how to spin flax, you can use a spindle if you want, or you can use a wheel. It doesn't really matter as long as you have a way to um, get the twist inserted and to hold the twisted yarn somewhere. But um, my main uh, issue with with this flax is dealing with this. Like I don't, if anyone knows what I might be doing wrong just from how I have this set up, please let me know. I fanned out all of the fibers before I put it on here, but there's got, there's got to be something that I'm missing because I don't know if this is the most uh, logical way to set this up on a distaff. <laughs> Crystal, are you speaking from experience when you talk about making watercolor paper? <laughs> Because I'm sort of guessing, based on having used watercolor paper, what it needs to be like. And when I've used inexpensive watercolor paper, I've been really frustrated because it can't do what I want it to do. So I'm sort of extrapolating that in order to make watercolor paper specifically, it's not as straightforward as just making paper that you could write on. <laughs> yeah, those castles. So. I would love to make more dioramas like that from my D&D games, which, yes, I'm playing again tonight. Uh, they are in the middle of a pretty epic battle. Um, so tonight we're going to see how that gets resolved. But I don't have anywhere to store something like that. Oh, poor Layla. She's, she woke up from her nap and now she hears me in here and is upset that it, <laughs> she can't get to me. <laughs> yeah, I've watched the whole gambit of crafters who make D&D or wargaming terrain. Just to get ideas. Sometimes I have an idea of what I want in the game, but I can't find a print. Thanks for stopping by, Evie. Bye! <laughs> Um, I, I can't always find a, uh, 3D print of what I want to print, and sometimes I'll, I like just making something from scratch. So, um, you know, part of me just wants to make more terrain type stuff, and watching her videos, it's so epic. But then I have no idea where I would put it when I was done using it. And I don't I don't know exactly why, but British homes accumulate dirt and dust like no one's business. I feel like I have to clean the house at least every single week. And I get that I work with wool and they have two cats and you know, two humans <laughs> who shed. <laughs> But it's just, I don't know, I would, I would have to find a way to store all those dioramas so they would never get dusty. And so not only are they big, but I don't, I don't constantly be cleaning them. Okay. I think I've generally got the hang of this now. I might bring you just a little closer. Might have to, uh... yep. There we go. And lower this a little bit. so that you can see my what my hands are actually doing.
again, this isn't a tutorial. <laughs> this is me just trying to make yarn. <laughs> I haven't thought about what I'm going to do with this project when I'm done. We are in desperate need of a second set of placemats. So I could, um, I could maybe look into getting a new, uh, dent for my rigid hull. So that it will um, accommodate a thinner yarn. Linen makes nice placemats, doesn't it? I just need something I'll be able to just toss in and, and wash on hot. <laughs> yeah, I've got a whole bunch of D and D minis. Um, I used to spend Sundays, well, Saturdays and Sundays, um, painting them before our games. But then, uh, all I was doing at the time was my PhD, and not, you know, everything else I'm doing right now. Makes it sound like I had loads of time when I was a student, but I, I really didn't. This, this keeps happening, where, like, when my hand gets a little bit warm and a bit sweaty while I'm holding this, this part right here, and it mats up the bottom and it starts to stick together. I should not be obsessed with making a super smooth yarn, because I'm a beginner, but I can't help myself. Um, yeah, so I'm amazingly playing with, uh, just printed or sometimes printed and primed minis. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry if you can hear my poor deprived little kitty. <laughs> Aww. Layla, you're being so loud. Oh dear, that joint did not hold. That's the other thing I'm going to have to learn how to do is make a decent join with this super duper long staple. Because seriously, it's, it's about two feet long. And it should be a lot easier to join in than it's proving to be. So there must be something that I'm not really doing that I should be doing to make this a lot easier. It's, oh, goodness. Oh. <laughs> this happened. Yeah. That's true. Um, when I first started um, teaching um, how to make yarn, I told the people I was teaching that there's nothing wrong with beginners teaching beginners. Because as long as there's transparency in the whole, I'm just learning and I might say wrong things, there's that caveat, then, um, you know, it's better than just saying, oh yeah, no, I know what I'm doing, um, but you don't. Mainly because with this type of activity, there aren't that many people who do it, and I don't want anyone to be turned off because it's just full of people who are inflating skills or just in general not being open to um, 
kind of everyone just learning alongside each other. Basically what I'm saying is I dislike elitism. So inflating skills because um, you want to be seen as some kind of a th I don't I don't really think this is the place for it. I mean, most places <laughs> isn't a, a good spot for it anyway. But if you're a beginner and you want to teach others, it's fine. So if you if you are learning something from me, uh, you know, please bear that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I used to teach martial arts for many years and um, white belts, that's the lowest belt and sometimes we would have to reiterate to them the difference between teaching and telling your partner your understanding of something And when you're talking about university students, there's a there's a big tendency for um, people in an educational institution like a university to want to teach as if they know. But with martial arts, there's a hierarchical system because of respect and expertise and experience, not because, you know, I'm on a power trip and I want you to all bow to me. It's more just, I have a deeper understanding of what I want you to do and the takeaway lesson from this. So I don't want you to be teaching, but I am totally fine with you saying, well, this is my understanding of this part of this form or this technique that they've shown us. That's fine. And, you know, it could also be the fact that as a society, we are pushed more and more towards getting a formal education, and we, I don't know, maybe get a little bit neurotic about being seen as authorities or teachers ourselves in, in some kind of position of power. And in the crafting world, it's sort of like... You might, know, you might know how to spin yarn, but you could still learn a lot from somebody who knows more than you or has been doing it for longer than you. So it's a matter of respect in that case. Hopefully this makes sense and I'm not just rambling. I could be rambling. I'm rambling. <laughs> but I wanted you to um, sort of see a little bit more what my hands are doing in this case. So I'm going to have to wind down the stream here in a little bit because um, I have some other things I need to do before uh, dinner and gaming tonight. So technically Sundays are my day off. <laughs> and I'm spending it here because I have to work on Saturdays and that was that's basically when our guild normally meets and so if I can't actually get to the guild meetings each month, then this is pretty much my only chance to interact with other spinners like myself. So, um, yeah. No, <laughs> I think she's um, laid down finally. My, my poor kitty. She's, she's something else. She's just over six years old. And uh, we call her kind of like our uh, anniversary cat because she was born when my partner and I started dating. <laughs> so we always know when we started dating and we also always know how old she is. <laughs> <laughs> Lock up your credit card and then go to Nerdforge and try not to be inspired to make everything that she's making. So she doesn't really do tutorials. It's just 
it's inspiring watching her do it. It's kind of like uh, whenever you watch a video of anyone making anything, it's like suddenly I want to make my own house and turn my own wood and become a blacksmith. <laughs> it's just something about process videos. I really find them relaxing and and deeply motivating. Like, I'm so inspired that I just want to go out and learn how to do those things for real. But I don't have time. <laughs> I don't have time and I don't have money. I don't have a car. I don't have a backyard large enough to have a forge anyway, so... <laughs> oh! Hi, Martha! Um... Are you, are you just new to spinning or new to spinning flax specifically? Because really, this is my very first day um, spinning flax like this. I've done a fair amount with hemp so far, but um, I haven't really done much draft spinning with these long fibers. So, oh God. Hopefully, I'm not going to die by duck poo. I don't know what's on these um, flax fibers. <laughs> I'm putting my mouth on it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, doing... Uh, so Sonia said, doing the... This is how I understand this is... Uh, the best way to get a different perspective. Absolutely. And sometimes it's a matter of reiterating something that you've probably already been taught, but when you learn something new, your brain really only remembers a couple of things about it. And so um, if, you, if you're teaching something, it's really easy to overdo it, or sometimes if there's a couple takeaways, but you're... Um, maybe uh, having a particular issue with one step, just someone saying this is, this is how I understand it or this is the way that I've done it and had success. You know, we're all trying to learn stuff and um, YouTube is a really fantastic resource for that, but I don't know if all creators um, expl explicitly state um, this aspect of I'm still kind of learning this myself, or I'm still kind of a beginner, but this is my progress so far. I think the ones that I, I tend to respect the most actually say that this is what I think, or this is what I've, I've done, etc. So yeah. Okay, so Martha is new to spinning flax. Cool. Um, yeah, so as, as I was saying, I'm, <clears throat> I'm new to spinning flax, and this is me just trying to figure out the coordination of it all. So um, I wouldn't be confident to actually teach anyone how to do this, but I'm at least confident enough to sort of point out what is useful. So for example, fluffing out the fibers from the strick when it comes, um, that is really, really useful. I can imagine if I tried to spin it without having done that, this would have been a complete nightmare. <laughs> um, yeah, so this situation down here, I don't know how best to fluff out the ends like this. I only, like I said, put about a third on here because I felt like if I put too much on, I would make a huge mess. And if I put too few on there, it wouldn't work quite the way I wanted it to, so that seemed like a, a fair gamble. But <laughs> from what I've been able to figure out so far, sort of spreading out the fibers 
before you put it on and doing something in this region to control the, the drafting uh, of this really long staple. Uh, those are two important takeaways that I've gotten from today's experience. I do occasionally have issues, which I don't have the answer to. Occasionally, um, it's like the fibers at this part uh, at the bottom, they get like flipped over on themselves and then they stick and then they clump up. And I don't really know how to deal with that part yet. So maybe, um, you know, just identifying that that is my issue, I can actually go hunt, uh, hunt the answer down on the internet. <laughs> Or if anybody knows uh, a video or a blog or something, um, please post that in the comments. I would appreciate it. Okay. Yes, do more spinning in public. <laughs> uh, so Martha said she's gonna <clears throat> do some demonstrations in an open-air heritage place. Yeah, primitive builders. I feel like there was a, a huge uptick of those videos during 2020. Build your own home for $5,000. Go off-grid. Actually, to be fair, there's a Facebook group um, called uh, Off off-grid homesteading or something and um, there's a lot of useful insights about like how do you deal with certain situations if you live off-grid because it makes you think you have to be much more self-reliant you have to think you know how much electricity am I generating versus how much I'm using so it's kind of fascinating okay Still doing pretty good on the yarn. I'm surprised at how smooth it is, given that I've been spinning this dry. Um, I might have to uh, really pay attention to what my hands are doing when I go back to ply it. But for now, I'm just um, I'm just trying to. When I pull it down, I'm also trying to smooth the fiber in between the creases of my hands as I'm going. So, when I apply it, one of the things that I could do is run it through the wheel to another bobbin so that the end where I'm done is then on the beginning of the next bobbin. And then when I ply it, I can ply it basically in the same direction in which I've spun it originally. And that way I'll be able to continue with the smoothness. So um, we'll see how I go about that process. Sometimes I just suddenly need my bobbins. Um, I think I'm all caught up on all my fiber talk videos. So that means I'll need to spin some more wool for that, uh, for the next uh, handful of videos. So, um, yeah, I might, I might need to just quickly fly this to get some free bobbins. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> it'll, it'll be a little while before I, I talk about plant fibers on Fiber Talk. Just because I have such limited experience using them, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've got some Gulf Coast Native that I want to spin. And I've got some uh, White Face Woodland that I want to spin. So uh, those videos will be hopefully coming out. Obviously, I've got to spin the. I've got to spin the yarn first. <laughs> um, but there, I've got some angora. Uh, I might do a fiber talk video on that. Uh, I did have an angora rabbit for a few years. Well, I 
think about a year in total. Because then I was going to go to Korea, and uh, bunnies do not fly super well, so I didn't want to stress them out. But, um, yeah, right now I'm thinking... I've got a decent amount built up now on the bobbin, so you can see. So I always start here and work this way, and then I start coming back. So I think if I do another row going towards this end, and then I do a second bobbin like this, I might see about um, running it through the wheel to um, orient the yarn so that the end here is on the start of the bobbin so that when I actually ply, I'll be plying the first bit that I've spun for both the two bobbins. And so I'll be able to maintain this smoothness without actually having to use any um, spit or water. So. We'll see. I, I want to keep it smooth if I can. If not, I don't know. Um, uh, I might have to do a sample to see how I like that, but I will try to do a video, maybe a live stream uh, of me doing that process so that you guys can see it. Okay, so. Um, if I do get, if I do get some time, I will, um, set up my good camera to actually record, um, what I'm doing here at the wheel, both with the spinning and the plying, uh, if I, if I get to that in a timely fashion, hopefully. Just because this camera is, uh, from a Galaxy S6 Android phone, and it's not super good, so... Um, I would like to be able to show you in greater detail, so I'll, I'll try to get my other camera out. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, do you have any suggestions for next week's video? Or live stream, rather, if, if you're interested in um, weighing in on the content? <laughs> Hopefully you are. <laughs> I mean, you are here after all. Yeah, um, don't you, uh, Sonia, don't, didn't you say that you normally uh, visit family on the first Sunday of the month? <laughs> um, yeah, so if you like this content, uh, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're new here, thank you for joining me. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. I do have my web shop, uh, www.actuallydie.com. I'm toying around with reopening Etsy, but with some big changes um, in order to make it viable. So I got a hint from another local Etsy crafter in the UK who um, markets to the US. So um, I'll look at the numbers and see if it's viable. But the more you guys um, kind of like give me feedback, the more I can sort of weigh the decisions. Um, yeah, and if you want to see anything um, in terms of like tutorials or uh, if you want me to talk about some of the other stuff that you might see <laughs> in the background, <laughs> uh, or if there's anything that I brought up today that you want to see more of, please let me know. Um, it turns out that I, I do know quite a lot, but, you know, if you spend any time talking with crafters, they talk a lot about the things they're really passionate about, and they often don't realize actually how much they know and how amazing and interesting it is to hear about it. So I feel like I, I'm really caught in this category, so 
yeah, if anything piqued your interest or if you want to hear more about some of the things I've rambled about, um, just let me know. Uh, give me some ideas and, um, you know, I'm happy to share pretty much anything that I know. Um, and as long as, you know, I can do it in a reasonable way. <laughs> I don't, I don't uh, have many friends who own sheep, so getting out to farms is going to be a little bit difficult, but <laughs> if there are any UK farmers who would be willing to invite me in to see their sheep, let me know. Um, but yeah, so that is going to be it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I've also put some links below, and if I haven't done this video, it will be soon, um, and I'll see you next week. So thank you so much for watching, everyone.